Selleck Levine, and I apologize that I'm not on camera. I am having technical difficulties, so my apologies. Uh, but I'd like to start by thanking you all for coming to the Fall 2021 World Affairs Lecture. The World Affairs Lecture is a long-standing program of the Social Sciences Department with the important mission to bring to the forefront issues of the day. We would like to thank the Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, Patrick Nisley, for his support of the program. We would also like to thank the chairperson of the Social Sciences Department, Professor Paul Clements. Today's lecture is a collaboration between the Social Sciences Department, the School of Liberal Arts, the Presidential Scholars Program, and the Office of International Programs. There are so many people who have contributed to making it possible. Mary Sujimoto, Professor Emre Osos, Nadja, but we all know whose brainchild this program is, Professor Praveen Chaudhry. So our really thanks goes out to him as well. Um, today's topic, journalism and women's rights in Afghanistan, has been on my mind for the last few months. In our participant list, I see some students from my class, so I know that they have been thinking about this issue as well. And I bet many of you who are in this meeting today have been thinking about it. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Susina Mushtaq, who will moderate today's event. Professor Mushtaq is a visiting professor in communication and media studies at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls. I turn the floor, the proverbial floor over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Chalik Levine for the introduction. I'm grateful to the organizers of World Affairs Lecture Series at the State University of New York Fashion Institute of Technology for inviting me to host this event. And I'm also grateful to my department at the University of Wisconsin River Falls for their constant support and participation in this event. I can actually see some of my students are here. I was officially introduced to Fatima Fezi at the height of the pandemic last year. On March 30th, 2020, Fatima's story titled I did not know whether to mourn or to celebrate. An Afghan reporter's girlhood education appeared in the New York Times. I had read Fatima's reporting on Afghanistan before, but this was a personal essay and it tugged at my heart. In this essay, Fatima wrote about her visit to Rustam School in a remote district in central Afghanistan's Bamiyan province, where she began her education and ultimately her journey with journalism. Fatima was only six years old when the US-led coalition took over Taliban control of Afghanistan in 2001, followed by an intense bombing. The invasion of Afghanistan was justified in the name of war on terror. The American war in Afghanistan would continue for two decades, becoming the longest war in US history. As the Taliban fell back in 2001, Fatima's family relocated to a village in Western Kabul. And shortly after settling in Dashte Parchi, her family made plans for her to attend school. Elsewhere in the country, Taliban had burned down schools that dared to educate young girls. But Rustam school lacked electricity, computers, and even a phone connection. Such rural isolation afforded slack, where girls could be taught alongside their male counterparts in a co-ed style. In her essay, Fatima wrote how her grandmother walked with her to the Rustam school for an hour, where hundreds of students in uniform congregated. Two thirds were girls. By middle school, 
Fatima and her peers lacked a classroom. They studied in a tent, which grew so unbearably hot in the summertime that Fatima often stayed home. The school with nearly 500 students now still uses overflow tents as makeshift rooms. Though Fatima later changed schools, the system did not change. In high school, Fatima fell sick and out of attendance for an entire year. That same winter, her father was badly burned in an oil tank of fire at a gas station in Mazar where he worked. As the oldest child, Fatima was responsible for taking care of him during his lengthy recovery. But despite it all, Fatima graduated from high school, became a journalist with the New York Times, and joined the Times Kabul Bureau in 2017. The reason this article was titled, I did not know whether to mourn or to celebrate, is because four days before finding out that she got her dream job as a journalist with the New York Times, Fatima found that her grandmother had passed away. I read the essay and wrote to Fatima. She was kind enough to respond. After that, we became Instagram friends. And here we are today. Welcome to FIT Fatima, Khoshamdeed. What an honor to have this conversation with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I feel honored to be here and thank you so much for having me. How are you feeling? Or if I may say, Chatur Hastid, I'm getting better because I have a very good Farsi teacher now. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm very well. As many of you know that Fatima and her family, along with several others who work for the New York Times, were recently evacuated from Afghanistan. When President Biden announced the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan this year, the longest American war finally came to a chaotic end. Um, Fatima, would you like to take us through the intense journey of leaving your life back in Kabul and coming to the United States? It is, it is, I think it is really difficult to begin from a certain point and say, this is, this was a time that I realized that I have to go to another country. Uh, I didn't know about my destination. Uh, two weeks before fall of Kabul, uh, I was going to the uh, New York Times Bureau every single day and I was crying every day because I was seeing that the country is falling apart. Provinces, districts after districts were fall, fall into the Taliban. And it was really difficult to see. And then I was feeling so helpless and hopeless because I was in touch with the uh, women in different part of the country. I was in touch with uh, university students. I was in touch with high school students. And they were telling me about uh, the Taliban presence in their um, areas. And for two, three weeks, I didn't know do anything. The only thing that I was doing, I was I was going to the bureau, talking about about the chaotic situation um, in Afghanistan, talking to security forces, crying, coming back. I didn't do anything. I didn't work on any stories. And then it was a, a day before uh Kabul uh fell that we had a meeting and once again during the meeting uh, uh the New York Times was working on a plan to um, evacuate us but we didn't know where is the final destination we didn't know where we were supposed to go during the meeting I got really emotional I got up and I was like this is not gonna work we are losing and I I, I could see the Taliban coming uh, to Kabul. And once again, I was crying and the entire bureau, even like I thought that my security guys were the toughest ones, but they were crying. He came to me, he was hugging me and he was like, I'm not gonna 
leave you alone here. I am here. And he was, he was talking to me as he was talking to his child. And I'm really, everybody was so emotional. And then I went home and that, that it was, it was difficult to, to see what exactly was happening to, to get a sense. Um, and then at the same night I had a dinner with a friend and, um, I, I didn't, once again, I didn't sleep all night. Next morning we went to the, I went to the bureau and then everybody was like, okay, there was a plan. There was like a plane was chartered. We were supposed to leave on Tuesday, but, but like Kabul was in a really chaotic situation. Everybody was out of their homes. Everybody was trying to get somewhere, but they didn't know where there was shooting. And then we were in the bureau. We waited for a while. And after that, uh, I headed back to my apartment. And then a friend was leaving for the um, um, uh, French embassy because she had a visa for the uh, for France and she was trying to get out of the country even before that. So I had somehow she was packing up. I was trying to understand what is happening. She she's a really strong woman. She's an artist. And I it was for the first time that I saw her broken. She was so broken that she hugged me. It was for the first time that I was seeing her crying. She hugged me and she said, we are not gonna forgive them and we are not gonna forget it. We will come back and we will, we will fight. I hugged her for a while, she left. And then that was, it was me and a big apartment and I didn't know whether what to do. I was, we, we had a WhatsApp message. We were trying to somehow trying to, like we were just waiting for an alert to head to the airport. And I called my parents, my, my siblings to get ready and go to the airport. So I don't know what time it was it. I don't remember anything about it, but the only thing that I remember is that I didn't know what to do because I had to pack my life in a back they were telling us that we don't have like much space. Pack as small as you can. First, I brought a giant uh, luggage. I put so many things in it and I didn't know. I was like, when I try to like to get, get it, I, I couldn't, it was so heavy. And I was like, it's not happening. So I called a friend of mine, she's French. She's my best friend. I called her and I was like, hey, I have to pack things and go to the airport. I don't know what to do. She was like, listen, find a backpack, hold a few things that reminds you of home. That's it. Do not, you can buy clothes, you can buy shoes. Do not think about uh, other things. Just get things that remind you of home. I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. I brought a back, like I brought a back. It was a small bag that I was usually putting my workout clothes like I, I brought that it is it is it was a red and black you know like the Afghan flag like the red always remind of us the the black shirt and then the the the, the dark is that dark days that generation of Afghans have been through so I bought that like a few dresses the jewelry that I had collected from Bamiyan and some other provinces like a tiny painting from Bamiyan and put it there and waiting uh, for my colleagues call and message to head to the airport. By this time there was shooting everywhere. I could hear shooting constantly close to my house and I got a call from my colleague um, Mujib Mashal. He was on the phone and I was once again I, I was I was telling him that I will have a panic attack. He was like, calm down, you will not have a panic attack. It is like just these people who are trying to make their way out. That's why they are shooting um, on air. I don't know what time was it when, when I got a message and they were like, everybody got, should go to the airport. I called a taxi. I didn't have any apps on me. I, I got out of the house, just locked my, my door, left everything behind and then went to the airport. On the way to the airport, everybody was out. People were like, they had so many questions. You could see that they are broken. They are confused and didn't know what to do. And 
some people were trying to get out of their houses some people were trying to get in it was it was a really chaotic situation so i went to the airport it was for the first time that i entered to the airport nobody checked me there was a lady it's according to Afghan culture, you have to have you know, your uniform on and you have to have a headscarf. But she didn't have head, head, headscarf on and she had like removed her jacket. So it was, she didn't have a proper hijab. She didn't even ask me where I was going. And then I, I, I crossed the checkpoint and uh, the first thing that I saw there was a guy with a gun. And I was like, this is not looking good. By this time, there were like people here, there, and then I went to the airport, we waited, and after that, uh, we were supposed to go to the to Ukraine, but uh, we waited, waited for really long, and then families joined us, and then there was a misunderstanding that they sent us um, to the international um, terminal, and then our plane was uh, parked in a uh, domestic terminal. So when we went to five minutes, five minutes changed everything. So we went to international terminal, came back to domestic terminal and uh, somehow waited again. And then one of our colleagues could make his way to the plane and others were left uh, behind. And then all of a sudden, like everybody was rushing to the airport. Everybody was trying to get out. I saw a lot of like officials that they were trying to get out and then by this time, there was shooting everywhere. Like everybody was shooting. It seemed that in Kabul, everybody had a gun. And this was the time to show their power. Everybody was shooting. So we were waiting. We were waiting. They said, do not leave the airport. And then we were in touch with our colleagues. We were in touch with our security guys and our editors and everybody. We were just waiting. And then a lot of people were waiting too, but we didn't know whether what is happening. So at some points we got a message that we should cross um, and um, we should go to a military side of the airport because the American Marines were there. We tried, but it was impossible because there were by this time there were a lot of people um, at the airport. We came back, were waiting, and then at some points we decided to go and and go somewhere safer because right. everybody was coming to the airport. So we went to a parking lot. It is It was a VIP parking lot. It was just for ministers and this stuff. We went there, closed the door, and somehow people were trying, once it was just our group, and people were trying to get in, and then we somehow managed to ask Americans to send uh, a tank to block uh, the gate. They did, and they were constantly shooting on us, constantly. And then we were like in this wide open area. Right. There were kids. There was no water. There was no food. There was no toilet. And there was like babies. There were babies among us. Nine right. men. A few days. And then there was like a chaotic situation. But I was. We were constantly, constantly in touch with our colleagues. God. Next I'm so sorry. I know this is very hard for you to talk about it, and I'm really sorry to put you through this. But I can, I mean, all of us actually saw the images and the videos of, of what happened at the Kabul airport. It gave us an idea. I mean, it was heart wrenching, and you had to actually go through that. Yeah. So, I mean, I cannot imagine how, it, how difficult it must be for you. I think no video, no photos, and no words can describe the exact scene of Kabul airport. There is nothing like that. So it was by seven or so we went from this parking lot to see to meet with American Marines. By this time, we were trying to somehow convince Marines to let us to go to the military side, but it was impossible. So we were once again, we were like in the at the airport domestic side, and there was like this rough sun. And we were waiting there for really long. And then people are trying to get to the military side. By this time, there were thousands of people. And there were like American Marines trying to control the crowd, but impossible. They didn't know how to deal with it. And then I checked my clock, my 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 um, phone, and it was uh, it was nine. And I 
I was like, oh my God, it's like super early and the sun was so rough. Everybody was so thirsty. By this time, nobody had food, water or anything. And then I don't know what time was it when I, I, I was like trying to somehow get a Marine to talk to me. I was just waving at them and somehow one of them came closer to me and I was like, I want, I, I was like, hey, this is my name. I'm working for the New York Times. This is the group that the New York Times is trying to evacuate. I want water because my dad was dehydrated and so many um, kids were dehydrated. And he looked at me and he was like, just look at me. I'm dehydrated too. And I have been here for 36 hours or so. I don't have any water on me. Do you want candies? And I'm like, no, no, I don't want candies. I want water. But whatever, he got, uh, he gave me some candies and I gave it to my mom and my sisters and some kids. Like, And then after that, another uh, guy brought three um, bottles and then he put it somewhere and said like, hey, this is for you, but do not mention that you got it from me. And I was like, of course. I got the water, I gave one bottle to my dad two others, just like others, like everybody drank from that. Somehow people were trying to come close to us. And then by this time, some other journalists from Washington Post and also Wall Street joined us. And we went from this side, somehow managed to get a Marines to let us to go to uh, a ship. We went there and then there was like a toilet. There was a restroom and then there was water and we went to that restroom and found like had our bottles and then we got the water from the restroom and everybody was drinking that if even we gave it to nine man's kid because the kid was like just grabbing the bottle and just drinking and then at some points we were just waiting there waiting there waiting there and then at some points there was a group that they were armed they like just attacked us and by this time, I was on the phone crying and saying so many bad things to my colleagues, to my editors, to the New York Times lawyer or whoever I could. And I was like, please do something. Otherwise, these women will be raped and then in public and then people will jump. I can assure you that because these people were armed, I could see them coming towards us. And then American Marines came and trying to control the crowd and then that, that there was uh, there were Turkish soldiers for a while and then we were just waiting there and I don't remember so many things about those those scene I don't know how but I have to, a friend said that she called me and I was like I don't want to talk to you but if something happened to me please let the world know how I died and I don't remember. I don't. I don't remember anything about that conversation. I said, like, a colleague of mine called. I said so many bad things to him. A friend had called. I said so many bad things to him too. But I don't remember anything from that. Those conversations. And then we would start waiting. By five, the Taliban came. There were like just two Taliban fighters. They came and they said, like, you have to go home. There is no plane go home oh my God. we 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 were just trying to walk and then we looked at each other and then somehow try to like send a signal that we were going toward marines by this time marines knew that we were coming and they were trying to get us out they were trying to rescue us i'm more i'm using these words because it was like literally a rescue process we were walking and then we met each other. I don't know, it was a miracle. We all met each other in a certain point and we were sitting in a circle, women, kids in the circle and then men were like just around us. Once again, people were just trying to come closer to us. There was an older- I can imagine. There was an older- I mean, it, it definitely, sorry, yes. Yeah. And then my mom said like, please go away. Let us go, we have all documents and here. And he was like, if I don't go, I'm not gonna let you go. This, by this time, there were like so many choppers. They were trying to fly like really low to control the crowd, impossible. We were watching the air, Marines were every, every single Marine were, uh, um, was in a position to come closer, but people were just going toward them. By this time, I think their brain wasn't not working anymore. It was like just, they were, 
they were doing something, but they didn't know what. And then we, we, but at some point we were waiting there maybe for 45 minutes, maybe an hour. But at some point, these two Taliban guys came and they were beating everybody. They beat up, they, they, oh my God. My mom, my dad, my brother, so many other uh, people, our colleagues had uh, all was fractured. And then we made our way back. Like we, we left everything, like the small luggage that we had, like we left it at the airport right. and we were walking back um, to get out. And then we didn't have anything, but the Marines were standing like so close. I talked with myself that we are gonna keep walking because by this time it was just my family and I. We, I didn't know what happened right. to my colleagues. So I said, I'm going to go closer to these uh, Marines and I'm going to tell them we are the New York Times and they will hopefully help me. I got so close, maybe a few feet away when the Taliban guy shouted and said, do not go close to them. So we were like, sure, of course, we right. will make uh, our way out. So, right. So Fatima, I mean, I can imagine like this entire process was really treacherous and very hard on you and the the entire you know um, people who worked for the times so like so how were you able to get out finally when you were you know when you were rescued you came you sat on the plane so i mean how long had pa time how long you know the time had passed since you were at the airport till you finally landed in the united states so we went back home but i couldn't go home because i didn't have anywhere to go so i was thinking to go to a hotel or somewhere it's in a hotel it is it belongs to aga Khan foundation but, uh, but I had no idea that the Taliban are already there. The Qatari had their embassy at the hotel. So when I was walking out, I saw a colleague. Uh, I was like, can I come with you? He was like, of course. We went there. We, we were in his home for two days, waiting for two days. It was the longest two days in my life. And then after that, we somehow managed, we got in touch, the New York Times got in touch with the Qatari government, and also we somehow managed to get in touch with the Taliban. Um, so it was Monday. Thursday, we went to Thursday, late Thursday evening, we went to the Serena Hotel. And from there, uh, we waited for a few hours. Uh, and then after that, we went to, the Taliban escorted us. Can you believe? Oh, wow. The Taliban escorted us. They uh, so you were finally able to get out of Kabul and then yeah. straight land in Qatar, and yes, from there we you. We went to Qatar, from Qatar uh, to Mexico City, from Mexico City to Houston. Oh it my God! The whole no. journey, like it was, it was, okay. it was like so, it was so crazy, and still I cannot wrap my head around. I can imagine, and I'm really sorry to put you through this, but I just wanted our audience to get a sense of how difficult it was for you to get out, even though you were working for one of the most reputed organizations, media organizations in the world, it was so hard for you to be able to come to the United States. But thank you so much, Fatima, for, for sharing that story. I, I really appreciate it. Um, in my introduction, I mentioned your essay that you wrote back in 2020, and that gave us an idea about your life. I was wondering if you could share your story of how you ended up becoming a journalist. What inspired you to become a journalist? So, as, as a kid, I loved literature because my mom used to read Hafiz or um, poetry uh, every single night. It was somehow a hobby. And so, before I could uh, read and write, I, could I had memorized so many poetries. And then I, was, I knew when I was really young, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to do something because my, my uncle was a writer, but he was, he was killed during um, uh, Mujahideen. And I had nothing from him apart from a, a few books and also some um, uh, audio records that I was listening to him. The person that I had never seen in my life, but I was listening to him him reading poetry, stories, that's how. When I graduated from high school, that you mentioned that once again, it was a difficult journey somehow. Um, my family was against me being a journalist, so I, I chose a different path. So I went to study photography for three, four months, and I was like, that was, a, that was an alternative uh, path to get, to, to get into, the, uh, into journalism. 
So I did that, and after that, um, I studied multimedia journalism for a year. During this time, I started working for different uh, outlets. Uh, and um, in 2015, when there was a big um, protest in Kabul, uh, a friend of mine got in touch with me and said, like, hey, Al Jazeera needs some photos. So I sent some photos and interviews to Al Jazeera, and that's how I started, and I keep uh, working um for al jazeera for two years or so and then in 2017 uh, a friend of mine who was working for the new york times back then left afghanistan for canada she messaged me and said hey i'm leaving you gotta apply for this job i was like of course how, what can i do she said follow the new york times bureau chief and also one of the journalists on social media they will announce about that there's a vacancy and you can apply. I waited for a few um, weeks, maybe two weeks, and then I didn't hear anything from them. So I Googled uh, Rod's name. I found his email and I decided to just shoot my shot. I did, and next morning he got back to me and you cannot believe the first email that I sent it to him, it is full of mistakes. <laughs> and, and Rod is a difficult person. Right, I, and there you still got the job. Right. So, Look at you, the go-getter. Yeah. So it was before the big bombing in Kabul, and then he was like, "Come see me." And after that, like a few days after that, the, the big bombing, the truck bombing, that 120 people, 150 people were killed, and the, like 2,000 or so were wounded. Uh, so it was June, July that I went to the New York Times Bureau for tryout. I was uh, there for two weeks, for a week. And then I did four stories. I contributed in four stories. Um, it was August 14th, as you mentioned, um, just a few days after my grandma had passed um, away. So I got a call from the New York Times and they said like, hey, we, we offer you this job. Do you want to sell one and take it? And I was like, of course, that's how, that's how I started. Right. No, uh, that's 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 definitely an inspiring story that your uncle and his his poetry, that your love for poetry actually inspired you to write. Yeah. Um, and as a journalist now, you know, because you were born and raised in war in Afghanistan, you have covered really intense stories. Earlier this year, you um, you wrote a new story about honorary public libraries that were built by women, right, to honor loved ones that were killed by Taliban. Uh, last year in September. You wrote another new story about Shamse Ali Zadeh, um, who is an Afghan coal miner's daughter and also a victim of extremist violence. Um, and despite all odds, you know, what Ali Zadeh suffered, she topped Afghanistan's national university exam. Uh, covering these stories is not an easy job. You know, as, as journalists, we are taught to be an unbiased, objective. But at the end of the day, journalists are human beings as well. I'm curious to, um, to understand how you as a journalist deal with trauma while reporting on such traumatic stories? It is, it is really difficult because I'm still suffering. I, I, I told you at the beginning that I don't remember so many things about the events that happened in, in, when I was in Kabul. Um, I cannot sleep. Uh, I still hear gun fire when I try to sleep. I, I suffer from PTSD. But I think uh, one thing that really helps me is like somehow as a journalist, you should find a way to deal with trauma, whether it's about to, whether it's talking, uh, walking, running, reading, or anything. Sometimes, yeah, you have to you have to be on therapy, but meanwhile, you have to help yourself. You have to. You have to, sometimes it is difficult to connect these dots. There are something missing in your brain. You keep thinking what is missing. There are like these little parts that I think when you have PTSD and you have trauma, uh, you cannot deal with it. But I found my way. I'm reading. I read a lot and sometimes I just um, go for walks and I cry a lot. I, I cry a lot. Sometimes I cry. I cry. For, for hours. Sometimes I sleep for 14 hours. Sometimes I don't sleep for two weeks. It is difficult, but still I am somehow manage, I'm trying to manage to get 
out of this situation, but it's difficult. And I think the other thing Thank is that it's, it should not be a taboo. We should talk about it. We should let our editors know about it. We should, we should just sometimes tell our colleagues that I cannot do it. It is difficult. Absolutely. We should not, we should, we should not pretend to be super strong and brave all the time. We, we, we should not, we should not be scared to make mistakes. That's how I manage to deal with my trauma. Oh, thank you. Oh my goodness. Of course, you're absolutely right about like mental health is still a stigma, even in this part of the world. And uh, even in our, you know, everyday school life and academia, our students are going through like so much. Pandemic was so difficult for everybody in this, in this country. Like we are talking about United States, the richest country in the world. And people had to go through hell during the pandemic and they're we're still reeling from what we you know what we experienced during the last uh, year and i can't imagine how difficult it must be for you like growing up in war and covering all these stories but i really appreciate you sharing that thank you um, thank you and one um, thing that in my culture when you're when you're going uh through difficulties and also you're suffering from trauma people say go pray Praying will definitely uh, it will help you and right. ask the God for help. And I was like, no, I cannot. And then the thing is like, we should, one thing that I want everybody to remember that it's not just in your brain. It is, it is happening to you and it's real. And do not try to brush it off and say like, okay, it's nothing because at some point it gets really bad. And Absolutely. And will be burned out. Absolutely. No, definitely. You're absolutely right about that. And it's very important to talk about it and then definitely go for therapy. Do something that actually will help you. And yeah. you're right. It, your reading helps you. Walking helps you. And sometimes also crying, you know. Um, so thank you. I appreciate that sharing. And I appreciate that you emphasize how much mental health is important for journalists. Uh, I also wanted to talk about something else. But before that, I wanted to talk about the Hazara community, uh, which is one of the largest ethnic groups in Afghanistan. And yet they have endured a, they, they have actually a long history of persecution. And Hazara people have endured various forms of oppression literally forever. And in fact, it won't be wrong to say that Hazara people are one of the most persecuted people in the world. I'm only saying that because Fatima, you are a Hazara and you have experienced violence firsthand because of your ethnicity. And you have also reported about the oppression of the Hazara community, right? Last month, in October, there was a bombing at a Hazara mosque in Kunduz, which resulted in the death of more than 100 people, followed by another bombing of a Hazara mosque in Kandahar, which killed at least 47 people and wounded scores of others. Could you uh, talk some of the challenges about some of the challenges that you faced working as a journalist in Afghanistan because of your gender and because of your ethnicity as well? So, um... Sometimes when people say, where are you from? I, I don't know how to respond to this question because as a Hazara, I was always considered an, an outsider in my own country, in Afghanistan. People were, people were calling me Chinese, people were calling me so many names. Uh, even as a kid, I had this problem at school. Growing up, in Afghanistan, facing so many challenges, becoming a journalist. Once again, it was difficult. Uh, sometimes it was it was really difficult to get people to talk to me because I was a woman and also I'm a Hazara woman. Sometimes people, officials were making fun of my face. Uh, sometimes people were not talking to me because I don't speak their language or something. But meanwhile, as a woman, sometimes I had the privilege of working with women, and also I had the privilege of uh, covering Hazara's issues in Afghanistan. As you mentioned about the bombing, as you mentioned the, about the girls, uh, like Shamsa Alizada, I, I got to cover her story and also the bombing. And so many, so many uh, stories about Afghanistan, it is really challenging. But meanwhile, I think when you when you face that, those challenges, it makes you brave, it makes you stronger, or maybe it is just me trying to convince myself that it's okay that people uh, don't uh, respect you, people don't uh, behave nicely, but 
at the end of the day, you are a human being, no matter if you're a Hazara, if you're whoever you are. It is difficult, but somehow I managed to 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 get the students done. Not, but not easy. It was really difficult. I can imagine absolutely. Um, so I was wondering while you're talking about your experiences, I mean, of being a woman journalist and on top of that being a Hazara um, journalist, um, I was wondering if you have noticed any differences between male and female Afghan journalists, um, you know, that have been working in Afghanistan. And at this point, I would also like to remind our audiences, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the uh, Q&A um, section here. You will see it right next to the chat. Um, so Fatima, coming back to you, um, do you, have you noticed any differences between male and female journalists working in Afghanistan? Yes, um, sometimes when it comes to rural Afghanistan, when you're a woman, uh, when you go there, you are, you're privileged. Um, you're privileged enough that people let you into their houses. You get to hear stories that a male colleague cannot. I, I did so many stories about women that they let me go through, go through their experience. Since they let me, they, they trusted me enough to share really, really personal stories. And I was, I, I feel honored and I really uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate them. But meanwhile, I, sometimes it is difficult because when you're a woman and you go to conservative rural areas, you always have to cover up properly. You always have to, have to respect certain uh, norms in the society. For example, I went to Kandahar and I tried my best to have something long, put my hair scarf properly, but at the end, this guy was trying to self protect me, not in a bad way, but he was somehow blocking. I don't mean that he was mean or something, but because he wanted to protect me, he was blocking my way. He, I was not getting access to certain things. And then at the end, he said like, Oh, you tried your best to hide that you came from Kabul, but look at your shoes. Your shoes show show that you're not from this area. You, <laughs> you have sneakers, you know, like this, this little things. Right. It's challenging. And um, sometimes when you're, you're a woman, people don't take it, take you seriously. They, they feel mm -hmm. that, oh, you are a woman and you're stupid or you're not educated enough or you don't know what, uh, how to do your job. I have like these interactions with ministers, deputy ministers, and also some officials that they were like try, they were at, like, they were behaving in a way that I'm a kid. I don't know right. how, to, uh, to, how to do my job. job, And that's why like some, sometimes I had to be like super challenging, ask really difficult questions, or some, sometimes right. I have to be rude to, in right. order to get my job done. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. I mean, it, I was working as a journalist. It was very hard for me to get access to some stories because I was a woman. Even academia, I mean, we have noticed that it's a very, it's very difficult to be a female professor because sometimes students don't take you seriously because of your gender. So yeah. I, I absolutely agree with you that it must have been really difficult. Um, well, continuing our conversation about journalism. I was wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about if reporting and writing for the New York Times is any different than reporting and writing for um, the local Afghan media. If there are any differences, what are they? Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, I have I have never worked for an Afghan outlet, but I have heard from um, Afghan colleagues that what they have been through. Uh, uh, when you work for an international organization and mainly for the New York Times, in you have protection and also you're privileged in certain degrees. Uh, when it comes to the New York Times, you know, the name is enough. And then even at some points, a friend of mine said that, that at some points the organization became your last name. And then your, that's how people know you. And the moment that you leave that organization, you people don't value that much anymore. Uh, we were privileged, we had, we could get access to so many things, and but with Afghan Afghan media, I can tell you that a colleague was killed, earning two four hundred fifty dollars in a month. He was one of the most dedicated and educated journalists in Afghanistan. He he was spoken seven to eight languages. He had his master's degree, and he was. 
he covered the stories in Afghanistan and in, in Rohingya and some other part of uh, the world, but he was killed. And today, nobody remembers him. Nobody remembers about his sacrifices. And I'm sure that even people don't ask his mom if she's doing okay. And then people even don't bother to go to his mom and say like, we are sorry for what you have been through and we are go you're going through. It is it is really difficult. Afghan journalists have no protection. Even some female journalists that I know, when they sign the contract, there are articles in the contract that when you leave your job, you're not allowed to work for another outlet for a year. Oh wow. My my friends were suffering. It happened to a friend, and then there are so many horrible articles. They were for for 18 hours or more than that, but at the end of the day, you 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 have nothing. They don't have life insurance, they don't have medical insurance, they have nothing, nothing apart from sometimes $350 a month, sometimes $450 a month. Oh That's the God. only thing that they have. And they, right. don't so get, they don't get that that recognition for their works either. Right. Right. Oh, thank you. I mean, of course, like New York Times, as I mentioned earlier, is a reputed organization, of course, you know, it gives you access, but it's very sad to learn about the local Afghan journalists working in Afghanistan, doing such incredible stories and still not getting the credit. That's definitely um, um, terrible. But thank you for sharing that, Fatima. I was also wondering, continuing to talking about uh, your journey as a journalist working with the Times, uh, could you give us an insight into the process of working with the New York Times, for example, like, who came up with the story ideas? Were your editors suggesting stories or were you the ones? I'm only asking that question because we have some um, journalism students here and they would like to know more about the process of working at an actual uh, you know, news organization. Um, the New York Times had uh, a special space for Afghanistan coverage. And I think we were, um, I mean, we were lucky enough that um, our editors were so committed to Afghanistan. Most of the time we were coming up with the story ideas. We were talking to each other, brainstorming, sometimes just joking, like messing around and we were like, okay, we are gonna do this story. We are gonna do that story. Or sometimes we were just, well, I was walking sometimes somewhere or just driving somewhere and I'm like, oh, we, we are gonna do something about this. So most of the time it was us talking to each other, seeing things on the street, talking to people, we were doing these stories, but sometimes it was editors that they were uh, they were they were coming up with these ideas, and they were like, "We have to do a story about it." Okay, interesting. Thank you. So, were there any stories that you wanted to do? You actually, you know, pitched to the Times, but they were rejected, or you could not do them for some reason. Were there any stories like that? Um, most of the time, um, the editors were always uh, accepting these stories, but uh, I was working on a story about there is a hospital in Afghanistan called Emergency. I know um, you know about emergency organizations. So there is a hospital. They have been here. They have been in Afghanistan for 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 decades. I was I was trying to write something about the scene in front of Emergency Hospital before the fall of Kabul. I even did some reporting. I talked to people because I wanted to. I wanted to show the face of the war from a tiny, tiny building that how it looks to to live in a war zone, um, war zone country or like people were saying that, oh, Kabul is safe or people say a lot of things about Kabul. But the thing is, there were so many bombings in Kabul. People were going through hell in Kabul. So I wanted to do that, but I didn't get the chance because the Taliban came. <coughs> And also, uh, excuse me. Sorry. No, it's absolutely fine. And there were, there was another story that, so Bamiyan has a special heart in my, this, this special, space in my heart and I, I love that province a lot for so many reasons. I'm from Ghazni, but that is that is kind of a home to me. So I, there was a 
bombing in, in uh, Bamiyan, um, uh, and then I don't remember whether it was, it was 2020, maybe at the end of 2020. And then I wanted to go back to, go back to Bamiyan and report the story, but my editor said no, because of my own mental health, because he knew how uh, emotionally and mentally it will affect me. So that's why, like he said, no, do not do that. Apart from that, they were always uh, accepting, uh, uh, accepting our story ideas, but we have a really long list to do the stories before the fall of Kabul that never got the chance to do it because the Taliban took over and everything, everything just crashed overnight. Right. No, I, I can imagine and I'm so sorry about that. Um, but I really appreciate you um, sharing all these stories. I have a couple of more questions, but I also am looking at the time. Um, so I want to open, um, you know, the flow to the audience. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to type them in the Q&A section. And our students, um, uh, we have Sydney and then we have Shahira who will be moderating. And if you have any questions, please, um, please feel free to type them there. And I will, or Sydney or uh, Shahira will ask those questions to Fatima. Do we have any questions, um, Sydney and Shaira? Do we have any questions at the Q and A section? We do. We have two in the Q and A section, and I actually have one here that did not make it to the Q and A. But they are asking, um, how should we keep attention on Afghanistan? Uh, you know, when news coverage moves so quickly, and there's so much we need to pay attention to. You know, how do we escape this lack of empathy or this desensitization that's occurring? Thank you for that question, um, Sydney. I think, yeah, Fatima, can you still hear us? Because there was some connection issue, I guess. Yeah, I, I didn't hear it properly. Sorry. Okay, so no, so the question was basically up. Uh, Sydney, do you mind repeating the question? Absolutely. It kind of reminded me of, um, you know, one of the stories, Fatima, that you wrote back in 2018. Uh, and you wrote, the world is tired of the story of war bombed out of Afghanistan. There's hardly any news anymore. So I think the question is somehow related to that. Sydney, do you mind repeating that question? Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely related. Um, they asked, how do we keep attention on Afghanistan when news coverage moves so quickly and there's so much to pay attention to? Uh, how do we escape the lack of empathy that arises or this desensitization that occurs? From my own personal experience, I think when it comes to personal stories, people pay more attention when it's just numbers, you know, like 500 people were killed somewhere or 500 people were injured somewhere. Nobody cares because it is just a number. But if we don't like go a little bit deeper and then just don't talk about numbers, we talk about personal experience, personal lives, people always pay attention. I have done so many stories uh, that, yes, the world is really tired of uh, Afghanistan's war, but the thing is that we we got, got to uh, listen to, to victims, and they are not just numbers. They are, they are human beings. When in, in, in my in my, in, in my opinion, then when one person gets killed in one family, it doesn't affect just his life, that it's it's shattered, it's gone, he's gone. It affects the life of the families because Afghanistan, in Afghanistan families are, are like a chain. When one thing happens to one family, it affects like so many people. Once I said like it is it is one when one person dies, just remember that he has a sister, he has a mom, he has family or, or, or so many people are involved. And that's why that's how at least at the New York Times, we could um, grab uh, readers attention and we somehow make them to care about these stories. And that's uh, that's that's what we did. And I think that's why that's when people pay attention. Absolutely. That is that's the profound answer that you know that people when you see these numbers you just you know 500 people 50 people are killed they're human beings and when you put as journalists put you know faces to those numbers then you actually see they are real human beings and it impacts people's lives so 
thank you for that answer, um, Fatima. That was absolutely correct and absolutely brilliant. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes, so we have another question asking, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge that women in Afghanistan will face now the Taliban has taken over, especially those girls who are in school and universities? Uh, people, women, they don't face challenges. Their identity, their existence haven't been taken away from them. In Afghanistan, uh, a woman doesn't exist anymore because she has, she, she, it's always her tied to somebody else. That's how she is. She exists. She is somebody's wife. She's somebody's daughter. She's somebody's mom. She's not a woman anymore. And she doesn't have access to education. She has not access to so many things. Nowadays that we, we, in, in, in so many countries, women fight about the right of equal Wage, uh, equal recognition for their works in Afghanistan. Families sell their daughters. Just before before this meeting, I read a story about my own province, Ghazni, that a family, a mom, is selling her 13 years old daughter. In Afghanistan, women are not even human beings anymore, and that really hurts me. That is, uh, that is, I mean, we, uh, we have actually seen it in your reporting as well when, you know, you were writing about how difficult it was for women to, um, you know, go out and get educated, you know, and even in your essay that the one that I actually kind of officially introduced me to you, you had talked that if you had not gotten the opportunity to get educated, you might have ended up becoming someone's wife and, you know, ended up having kids and not pursue your own dream of becoming a journalist. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Fabula. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Absolutely. Um, Ilan is asking if you would be willing to speak more about life in Afghanistan as a person with Zara ethnicity, especially uh, as a woman journalist in that regard. Um, life in Afghanistan, sometimes when we, you know, like when we talk about lives, life doesn't mean that you're just alive and this is this is life. You're alive, but you're not living it. And also that, that famous quote from somebody that some some people die in age of 28, 25, and they are buried in when they are in the 70s. This is this is how sometimes life feel in Afghanistan. And it's it's really as as a woman, it was really difficult for me. Uh, at some points in 2020, when uh, the whole world was dealing with COVID, and we were dealing with assassination. Women in my age, uh, so many people, so many people got killed. Yamos Yawash, he was one of the famous Afghan journalists and TV anchor that just a few days ago, like five days ago, it was his anniversary. And I knew him in person. He was, he was killed and, and Yet we don't know who was behind that assassination. A, a young woman, um, uh, Fatima Natasha Khalil, who was working for the Human Rights Commission, she was assassinated, and yet we don't know who was behind this assassination. So, so many people. It was really difficult to 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 live in Kabul and live in Afghanistan in general. And and when we 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 talk about one thing that. Sorry, I'm, I'm living from unfortunate. And uh, one thing that most of the time, uh, foreign journalists forget about is that they say like, oh, this is women in rural areas and this is people in Kabul. They feel that Kabul is somewhere else. It is not in Afghanistan, but Kabul is also in Afghanistan. And in, in Kabul, people were going through a lot. People were experiencing big, big bombings, massive casualties. And in, in Afghanistan, we don't live a life. We are just alive to go through hell. In Afghanistan, if I can put it, Af Afghanistan is an actual hell on the face of the earth. You don't have to die to go to hell. If you go to Afghanistan, you, you, you experience that actual hell. 
That is that is really really sad way to put it. Uh, uh, do we have uh, time for any more questions? I'm asking the organizers. Do we have some more time for more questions or? Yasmin, uh, do we have time? I think we have time if there are more questions for one or two more questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Sydney or Shahira, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, so we have two more questions, so maybe that'll be perfect with the time. Um, so Amir is asking if you ever experienced resistance or aggression in Afghanistan because you work for an Af um, American media. Mm, not really. Yeah, I think Padma already mentioned like New York Times is a big organization and it was that actually gave her access to stories. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, can we take one more question from the audience and then um, I want to wrap it up. Sure. Oh, we have a few to choose from, I see. Um, okay, so let's take this last one. Um, they're asking if the state of Afghanistan had encouraged you to become a journalist. Um, and they also thank you for sharing your story, of course. Um. I think so. Uh, it did because after 2001, when I think 9/11 uh, changed so many people's lives, and that's including me. I don't remember anything about 9/11, but it. I grew up in a Republic Afghanistan, and uh, that was the time that I got the opportunity to go to school. As I mentioned in one of my uh, insider uh, pieces, that. If the 9-11 hadn't happened and the U.S. didn't uh, invade Afghanistan, maybe today I was I was a mom with five kids, a young mom. Right. No, absolutely. And now that you are in the United States, um, I just wanted to ask you one final question that, in a way, will wrap up, um, you know, our session, this amazing session that we had with you. Uh, what are your hopes for the future of Afghanistan and your own life? It is, it is really difficult to say it because my hope for the future of Afghanistan is for Afghan women. I want, I want them to go to school. I have, I, I have a six year old niece that now I'm in the US. When I see a young girl, I constantly think about her. I don't want her to to get married when 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 she is 15 i want her to go to school because she is she's really she's really smart and it is not just her it's millions of women it's millions of kids that today because of uh, the taliban they are banned from attending uh, secondary schools and my hope my hope is for afghan women i want i hope that one day Afghan women will get the chance to make their own decisions, decide about their own lives, do their own things and pursue on their own dreams. My hope for me, I don't know because I still don't know what is my situation because you know when you when sometimes I feel like I hear it from somebody else before fall of Kabul that when you're a refugee and when you're an immigrant you're just a number and today I'm just a number and somebody ha else has the control of my life and they decide whether what should I do, where I should go and what should what will happen in the future. I don't know about my own life. It's, it's like literally like feeling in a bubble. Well, we really hope that um, something good comes out of it. And we wish you all the very best in everything you do. And we, we all of us say amen to all your hopes and wishes for the women of Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Fatima, for sharing your um, story with us for your time. I would like to, uh, Professor um, Chalik Levine, um, I want to give the stage back to you. And if you have any final closing remarks. Thank you, Fatima, again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatima for your amazing presentation. 
I think we are all listening and we are in awe of your, the strength that you show in the face of adversity, your writing, and really your bravery. I think the many young women who go to FIT and who are on this call are going to stand up a little stronger after this presentation because now they have a Hazara Afghan journalist as a role model as well. Um, I know that many of you are probably feeling as emotional at the end of this world affairs lecture as I am. So that also goes to show to your poetry, both Fatima and Susina as well are host extraordinaire. I think I've said it and I'll say it again. I never want to host anything without Susina in the driver's seat because she is amazing. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us for this important conversation. I think the more people who know Fatima's story, the more hope there is for those young girls and women of Afghanistan. Uh, I think the next step for you, my hope for you, is a book that will be a New York Times bestseller because other people need to hear this story. I mean, we had an amazing turnout at the lecture today, but we need to go broader and um, we more people need to hear this story. Uh, I just want to end by thanking everybody who contributed to making this event possible and for everybody who is attending the session. And of course, to President Brown, who is also listening in to the conversation, uh, Dean Patrick Nisley, Chairperson of Social Sciences, Paul Clement, and everybody else I thanked earlier in the meeting. And of course, our fearless leader, Praveen Chaudhry as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for having me and I really appreciate it. It was, it was such an honor. Uh, Likewise, thank, Fatima. thank you. Thank you also to our students, Sydney and Shahira, uh, for fielding those questions and to Professor Emra Osos as well. Um, and, and again, my apologies that uh, you only see my initials rather than my face. Technical difficulties, this is what our new normal is. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and we wish you all the best as you move forward in this process, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Praveen, do you want to say a few?